Stephen asks, I think, a really, really, really interesting question. Um, and I mean, the first one to say is that in the UN Security Council resolutions, China did not veto any of the resolutions um, which legitimized this war, neither the original one nor the other ones under which NATO was there. So um, China has not, has not expressed, anyway, opposition to the war. But the question you ask, it goes absolutely to the heart of one of the reasons that we are failing. Uh, because NATO, in its usual way, has believed... I actually think we are reaching the beginning of the end of, the end of, a, of 500 years of global domination of Western power, Western institutions, and Western values. We're going to have to learn to share the world with other power structures. And NATO has not yet come to that conclusion. One of the basic principles about building post about peace post-conflict is to involve the neighbours. One of the reasons why I could do that in Bosnia was because the Dayton Agreement brought in the neighbours. It brought in Serbia, it brought in, uh, um, it brought in uh, Montenegro, it brought in Croatia. And if I wanted to get things done, frequently in Bosnia and Herzegovina, I would go to Belgrade, I'd get to go to Zagreb. You have to bring in the neighbours. In Northern Ireland, we only began to build peace in Northern Ireland when we understood that Dublin had a legitimate role to play. We could not exclude them. And it was only when we built in Afghanistan one of the terrible failures of Afghanistan. By the way, the biggest failure is the one they wanted me to go out there and try and sort out. But it still hasn't been sorted out, is that the international community is completely incapable of speaking with a single voice. Each of us think we are Afghanistan's where we're fighting. We think it's Helmand, the Dutch think it's Ruzgan, the Canadians think it's Kandahar, the Germans think it's the Panjshir Valley, and the Americans think it's bombing from 15,000 feet. There isn't a single plan. But the second baleful problem, the second really big problem, is that we have refused to involve the neighbours. Now, if you take Afghanistan, Iran, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, China, Russia, let's not forget Russia, an important part to play, let alone India and Pakistan, every one of these countries has a direct interest in making sure that Afghanistan does not sink into a vacuum of instability, civil war and turbulence. Even Iran doesn't want that to happen. And the vast majority of those, including, for instance, Pakistan, including Saudi Arabia, not a neighbor, but certainly a potential player, including certainly China, has a, and Russia, of course, has a direct interest in making sure that jihadi terrorist Islam does not triumph in the region. And yet we've sought to involve none of them. None of them. We're trying to do it by ourselves. You can't do that. If this is a multilateral operation, you have to bring in others. Now, will the Chinese ever supply troops? I doubt it. But we should not in any way underestimate the enormous influence that the Chinese could have, for instance, on India, for instance, the, the economic and other influence they can have in the region. What I proposed four or five years ago, when I, they were thinking of me going, what I suggested to the present government is that we should have a sort of second Dayton agreement, much the same as Seamus is talking about. A sort of second, not obviously constructed on an American Air Force base, a genuine international agreement that will that we'll safeguard the territorial integrity of, uh, integrity of Afghanistan and in which the, the guaranteeing powers would be Russia, China and the other regional players. And they then, you then bring them in to preserve that territorial integrity and you create a complete new circumstance about how you could resolve this, including some of the Islamic countries. My own view is that the solution to Afghanistan may now come rather more from the participation of Islamic countries like Saudi Arabia, I'm not a great Saudi fan myself, but Islamic countries, if only we can give them the space to do so. So you're absolutely right, sir. The absence of China, the absence of a sufficiently humble approach to this on the part of NATO that wants to involve others beyond the Atlantic Club in helping to solve this problem is one of the key reasons why we haven't succeeded. Seamus will want to answer in a minute. Can I just come back, Dina? Um, I went to see. Actually, it's not true that no one's ever won in Afghanistan. Um, there are two people who were in Afghanistan. Um, one is Alexander the Great. You may think that's a long time ago, but he did nevertheless. And the second was um, Lord Roberts of Kandahar, who went in in the Second Afghan War in 1879. Uh, both of them, however, were wise enough to go in, do the job, and try not to stay. They went in and got out quickly. By the way, when I first went to see Mr. Blair shortly after 9-11, he told me that's exactly what was going to happen here. We weren't going to try and stay. We are going to go in, do the job, and, and leave. And I said to him, Prime Minister, I think that's a good idea. Trying to stay in Afghanistan is not a particularly good thing to do. So it has been done before. 
It's never been, however, the case that a, a, an operation like this has been undertaken with the support of the people. And I think our failure in Afghanistan has not so much been trying to stay, maybe we had to do that to create an area of stability, but completely failing to engage the neighbors and the Afghan people themselves. And above all, uh, doing the easy thing, which is using the easy structures of power, which are the corrupt structures of power of Karzai, rather than beginning to build from the bottom up um, and painfully a proper uh, system of the rule of law in Afghan hands, not Western hands. And those, it seems to me, are the failures. Mr. Rashtan. Uh, well, hang on. Shane, sorry. Shane, sorry. Shane, sorry. Shane, sorry. Well, I was, I was going to come back on when most of his points later, towards the end, but just to pick up what's a little bit of what's been said just now. I mean, uh, Dina was raising this point about um, the ethnic groups shifting around and, in Afghanistan, and so there could be no negotiated withdrawal. I mean, the, I think the, the, the point to bear in mind, and in a way I agree with Paddy quite a bit about this, is that, that the, 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 ethnic, the different ethnic groups and the different political forces in, in Afghanistan are closely related to the surrounding powers. Uh, so Pakistan has been, was not only the original progenitor in a way of the Taliban itself, but has been closely connected with the Pashtun people who are the largest ethnic group in the country uh, and regard themselves in some way as uh, sponsoring that part of the country. Uh, Iran is very powerful in the west of Afghanistan. Um, uh, other Central Asian countries have a lot of influence in the north. Uh, India is very powerful in the country and they all play those ethnic groups as well and their interests in the country. That's one of the reasons why, if you're talking about stability, I mean, I don't think this war has brought stability to Afghanistan at all. I mean, not even slightly. I mean, it's completely destabilized the whole area and, and, and uh, brought destruction to Afghanistan. But uh, I do think that in the context of withdrawal, it can and should be a negotiated settlement with all those countries in the region. And that's not just to uh, for them to be guarantors, but it's also in relation to the point you're saying, so that every part of the country feels it has a slice of the action uh, it's, and their role and their position is guaranteed from outside, so that no, no, none of the surrounding powers, regional powers, has an interest in undermining that uh, settlement. As I said, I do think that's what's going to happen in the end anyway. I mean, after the Soviet Union withdrew, um, that should have happened then and it was supposed to happen then and didn't uh, for other, I think, international uh, power play reasons. Uh, I mean, I, I, as to the Chinese point, I think maybe Paddy's underestimating the extent to which this invasion was the product of a neoconservative government in the United States that wanted to exercise and be seen to exercise power and intervention and control in the heart of the Muslim world. And of those countries that are part of the occupation, they are overwhelmingly Western states, uh, either European, North American, or uh, Australasian states. There are, I think, two Muslim countries involved in it, Jordan and uh, Turkey, I think. Um, how long Turkey's role continues there in Afghanistan would be interesting to see. But anyway, uh, not surprisingly, it's perceived throughout the Muslim world as being a Western intervention and occupation. I'm sure that China has no desire to be part of that. I, I would certainly see the occupation of Afghanistan in the tradition of Lord Roberts of Kandahar and Britain's three previous Afghan wars. And I think that's part of the problem about it. I think it is a modern colonial operation. And I think at the beginning of the, of the Afghan war, in the beginning of the war on terror, there were a number of powerful voices uh, in and around Western governments, including in Britain and in the United States, that openly argued in favor of a new imperialism. And they wanted it to be a more multilateral form of colonialism than in the past, but they were explicit that that, that that was what was needed in the post-Cold War world. I mean, one of them, Robert Cooper, for example, is now uh, a very senior official in the European Union, but there are plenty of others. Um, there's less talk about that now, but I think that is an underlying element in what's going on in Afghanistan and Iraq um, and in the other parts of the war on terror, and it's very significant, I think, that Every single one of the states that, are most, that have been most targeted in the war on terror that I mentioned earlier uh, were formerly British colonies. So I don't see that as a positive thing. I see that as a negative thing and part of the problem about the occupation. But on Paddy's other points, I'll come back later. Yes. Uh, yeah, the, the, the dynamic duo from Wincanton. Uh, first, first of all, there was a, a point about, um, about casualties and measuring of casualties. I mean, in fact, in Afghanistan, uh, 
there has been some pretty good measuring of casualties, not so much by the UN, which um, I think has, has, has not played a great role, but there have been some, some people who've used the same techniques as the Iraq body count, uh, which I would say is quite a heavy <coughs> underestimate. But in, in Afghanistan, it's been done in quite an effective way. There's a guy called Mark Herald, based in the US, who has done, I think, the most ex exhaustive counts. And one of the things it shows is that there are that the civilian casualties are quite a lot larger than um, both NATO and, and UN figures would suggest, and that's very well uh, underpinned. I mean, it clearly is one of the uh, the most devastating factors in the war, which has happened time and again. And I'll come back in a minute later to the point about public opinion in Afghanistan, but I think that's clearly one of the things that is driving the growing opposition to the occupation, which I would say is certainly a lot larger than Paddy would um, suppose. On the question that John raised about Israel, I mean, there's no question that the Israeli occupation and the dispossession of the Palestinian people is a massive mobilizing force throughout the Muslim world, and it was one of the factors that helped mobilize uh, the Al-Qaeda uh, phenomenon. But much, I mean, the Al-Qaeda phenomenon is a very small thing compared with a much broader anti-Western uh, sentiment throughout the Muslim world. But I think it's, it's only one factor I mean, in a lot of the Arab world, there's also the fact that the West supports tyrannical, dictatorial regimes throughout the region uh, to, uh, in my opinion, to keep control of resources in the region. And that is a source of underlying hatred as well. Um, but I also would caution a little bit about um, picking on the issue of the pro-Israel lobby as being the decisive factor. The pro-Israel lobby in America is very, very powerful. but I would say that uh, there are other um, forces in, American, uh, in the American state that determine its support for Israel over a long period of time, strategic reasons, which may now be beginning to tip, as, as General Petraeus recently suggested. But I think there are powerful interests uh, supporting uh, the Israeli position in the Middle East, which go beyond just lobbying in politics. Are we running out of time? Yes, we are, sir. We are, the clock is now ticking, and I, you know, the absence, the vacuum that is where an explanation should be as to why this war is important, so I try to lay out some of the reasons, has led the British people, the Dutch, and most of the contributing nations, public opinion, to continue to shift heavily against the war. There's no question about that. And I think we now, as you may welcome this in this room, um, I don't, I have to say to you, I think we now stand a real risk of losing this war in the pubs and front rooms of Britain long before our soldiers lose it to the deserts and mountains of Afghanistan. Unless we can turn that round, unless we can more cogently explain to the British people why this is a war which it's in our interest to be engaged in. Um, and no government has effectively done that. Yes, the time, the clock is running out. And, you know, James is right, people are now heading for the door. Uh, there's no question about that. They're doing it either openly, like the Canadians and the Dutch, or um, there is a, a move now which is more and more subtle move um, going on. And he's right in saying that uh, Obama may well be uh, reconsidering his position towards the end of this year. Uh, and this government is certainly thinking about it very seriously. Or they don't, you shouldn't assume anything that I said to you to be the government's position um, here. Um, second point about casualties. Yes, yeah, Seamus is right. There is a much more accurate version of casualties here. Um, um, uh, however, he's wrong in saying that the appalling casualty rates by misuse of air power, um, unthought of air power, um, by the United States in particular, um, are, is going up. It's not actually, it's declining. He is right to say that um, Petraeus said he would make a serious effort to stop this and his success in doing that has not been as great as it should be. All of us have argued that the American-induced airborne casualty rate, which is wholly opposed, by the way, by our own soldiers on the ground there, has been one of the most significant factors that has caused problems amongst the population um, in areas where we need their support in order to be able to make this successful. But look, I mean, just let's remember, and it's a horrible thing to say, forgive me if I say it, I know I'm putting myself in difficulty here when I do, but it is one of the factors of war that people tend to get killed and <coughs> be the wrong ones. Uh, I mean, I can remember in Kosovo, I can remember in Kosovo when an airstrike hit a wedding party. I can remember in Kosovo when it hit a refugee column. And though I, you know, I never met a single Kosovar Albanian who, who, who said to me, you should never have um, gone to war 
and you're prepared to go to war with Milosevic in order to get us back into our homes because that was the damage that was done to a few people in consequence. It's part of the dreadful calculation of war. It's why politicians have to really seriously think before they go into this and have to constantly review that position afterwards. I'm afraid I disagree with Shane's completely on this road. Um, Israel is the burden code at the heart of all of these problems. It is our double standards in our approach to Israel. It's the fact that we have refused to, we, we exercise international law against everybody else, but we refuse to pay, uh, to we regard international law as important governing the actions of Israel as well. Um, this is the burning coal at the heart of all, and far, far, far more than the occupation of Afghanistan, by the way. It is, the, uh, it is Israel and Israel's attitude towards the Palestinians which acts as a primary motivating force, uh, which radicalizes so many in Islam. And the really disgraceful thing, ladies and gentlemen, is that um, Israel has now been able to act illegally under international law um, to be able to make this so-called two-state solution a, a practical impossibility. They've now got illegal settlements across what would be the second state, the Palestinian state, which is the basis for any peace in Israel, which makes that state completely unviable if governed by the Palestinians. So this is the problem. It is at the heart of the problem, and if you could begin to resolve the Israel-Palestine problem, I think the rest of these problems would find, uh, you would find would be relatively easier to follow, to resolve. Uh, now, one final word, if I may, John. Yeah, uh, I, I, not one. Uh, one final word, if I may. I'm not quite so bleak about Obama as Shavis is. Obama strikes me as being quite, in one way, quite like Lincoln. Um, he's a man who has a degree of strategic patience, and he takes his problems one at a time. And I think he has consciously made the decision that in order to counteract the Israeli lobby, the Jewish lobby in America, he needs to build up his domestic support. And he's therefore done um, health reform first, taken on Wall Street, is building up his support in the domestic issues in order in time to go on and start to take on some of the big foreign policy issues. The fact that he hasn't done it early may well be because he recognizes that if he did try to do that, he would lose immediately. But I can see the beginnings of a real shift in both the Obama statements and Hillary Clinton statements about a much more skeptical attitude towards Israel, and Israel can see it too. So I wouldn't be entirely without hope on this front that America will at last see that bring Israel uh, to understand the importance of international law is not just in Israel's interest, it's not just in the Middle East's interest, but in the long term in the United States' interest. Okay, I mean, many people have raised lots of good points which don't really need answering their good points in themselves. Um, but just to um, pick out a few, um, our friend over here said, what about the crimes of the Taliban and, and abandoning the people of Afghanistan to the Taliban? I mean, remember that the Taliban control large areas of Afghanistan now. Um, and the, as I, I tried to draw attention to earlier, the, is the, the fact that in other areas of the country where, which are controlled by warlords, that the conditions are often worse in many of the things that the uh, Taliban have been rightly uh, criticised or, or attacked for. Um, and I think you know, the, this whole idea that unless peoples of the world uh, are looked after by, by us, they can't manage their own affairs and we mustn't abandon them, that, I think it's a very important thing to get away from. Uh, you know, the people of the world can manage their own affairs and the Afghan people have to run their own country. Um, and it's not uh, a matter for, I mean, a lot of the problems in the country are exactly the result of foreign intervention rather than uh, being prevented uh, by it. Um, just to pick up a couple of other things, uh, the just war principle, I completely agree, that is at the heart of this issue. And, you know, according to all the traditional religious and philosophical uh, explanations of it, uh, neither in the Iraq case, but at uh, the most extreme end of the spectrum, but even in this case, as I tried to spell out, um, I don't think uh, those principles have mostly been met in the Afghanistan case, one of the reasons why I don't regard it as a just war uh, from the start. It was a wrong cause from the start. I think um, you were right to raise the issue of what were the motivations for 9-11. I actually agreed with pretty well everything that Paddy said about Israel, I was just drawing attention to the fact that you, I think you have to be cautious of <coughs> what the motivations, the American motivations are for supporting Israel. I don't regard the lobby issue as the, the overwhelming uh, cause of that. Uh, but I remember what the Al-Qaeda, what Bin Laden said uh, immediately at the time of uh, the 9-11 attacks. The three things he mentioned were Israel-Palestine, uh, the um, sanctions that were then against Iraq and the suffering of the Iraqi people, and the 
occupation or the presence of, of American troops in Saudi Arabia. And so, I, I mean, actually, it's a broader thing about the presence and control of Arab and Muslim lands from their perspective uh, that is at the heart of the problem. And that's why Afghanistan has made the situation work worse, as has uh, the occupation of Iraq, obviously. Um, and any more interventions, like in Somalia and Yemen, are only going to make the situation worse again. Um, I'd like to pick up um, some of Paddy's original points, if I, if I may. I mean, he, he said um, that the issue of the wrong cause hadn't been addressed. Now, I think from the, from the start, it was clear that the consequences we've been discussing today and the horrors that have been created by the Afghan war and the spillover, the destabilization of the wider region was foreseeable then and actually was foreseen and discussed at the time. And I was trying to... Uh, to mention that uh, at the beginning. Um, secondly, Paddy's very um, sceptical uh, about uh, the, um, the points I made about Afghan public opinion. Um, I mean, I think it's actually pretty obvious that um, when you're a, a company carrying out opinion polls in a country under a military occupation and you're one of those countries, uh, you're representing one of those countries, that people will be very cautious about saying that they support armed attacks on your troops uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, but there, I think there are good reasons to understand why actually public opinion in Afghanistan is a lot more hostile than even those opinion polls which show they want troops out within two years uh, would suggest. Even in those opinion polls in provinces like Helmand where British troops are and Kandahar uh, where they might have been sent to, they show majority opposition to foreign troops. So where our troops are, even according to those opinion polls, they want the, the, the population want them out now. But I'd also draw attention to a Pentagon report that, that last month, which showed that of uh, only 29 of 121 critical Af Afghan districts could be classified as sympathetic to the government and the foreign forces, compared with 48 who were considered supportive or sympathetic to the Taliban. So I would suggest that maybe Paddy's wrong about that, and that actually the evidence points strongly to much greater hostility to foreign occupation than he would suggest. Um, as to the matter of you, the, 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 the occupation is being carried out under UN mandate, I mean, it's only true in the sense that it is also the case in Iraq. There is also a UN resolution operating in Iraq, and uh, American troops are there under a series of UN resolutions which began in May 2003. Uh, and in Afghanistan, the occupation was only given the imprimatur of the UN after the invasion had taken place. So, I mean, I would take those, uh, those, it's true that those UN resolutions exist, and I think they were wrong, and they shouldn't have been passed, because they're giving some veneer of legitimacy to the occupation. But I don't, they certainly didn't uh, endorse the, uh, the invasions originally. Uh, Paddy thought that the, a series of bombings um, would be, would, 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 would uh, have been worse or wouldn't have taken place if it, uh, you know, if it hadn't been for this necessary operation to give the example of 7-7 in Britain. I think it's exactly the opposite of the truth that the, the occupation of Afghanistan and Iraq were the things that fueled the terrorism and actually if you look at the statements by the 7-7 bombers, they made that quite explicit. Um, again, I, 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 I take exactly the opposite view on the um, the issue of Pakistan, I think, um, far from with, uh, negotiated with withdrawal from Afghanistan making the situation in Pakistan worse, I think it is the Afghan war that is creating the spillover effects, as we see every day with these drone attacks and the horrors that are taking place there. This, is, this all uh, derives from the spillover of the war and the presence of uh, not only Al-Qaeda, but the growth of the Pakistani Taliban in those areas of the northwest part of the country. Uh, now, finally, on the standing of NATO, um, Paddy is very concerned that a negotiated withdrawal from Afghanistan would, um, would undermine the standing of NATO. I don't think uh, that's the case in quite the way he says. I think if it was a negotiated withdrawal and it led to a peaceful, stable Afghanistan guaranteed by its neighbours with all political forces taking part in the country, that, that shouldn't be the case. But anyway, NATO is a Cold War alliance and what it's doing uh, in Afghanistan is a big question. I think we need different kinds of military alliances and international alliances in a post-Cold War world and NATO has been used in the post-Cold War world as a form and a, a mechanism for Western intervention and actually that's a destabiliser, not a stabiliser. Um, finally, he mentioned the, the point about uh, casualties uh, uh, going down. Actually, if you look, for example, in February there were 80 civilians killed according to um, 
according to UN figures, in the same February last year there were 50. So actually there's been a number of different uh, and pretty horrific attacks in the last few months. It hasn't gone well at all from the point of view of the promises uh, that were given. But I think just to finally say, I mean, the, it's clear that the occupation is failing, it's clear that the war is failing, it was clear that that would be the case from the beginning, it was a criminal act, the 9-11 attacks, it wasn't a, a, a war launched by Afghanistan, the occupation of Afghanistan and Iraq have made the situation far, far worse, have spread terrorism, not undermined it, and that's, you know, part of the overall picture of why we need to press now for a negotiated withdrawal from the country and a stable and independent Afghanistan. Thank you, thank you. As Seamus has very confidently done, just to press one or two of the questions. Sue Farrell, public opinion. I'm not sure you're right, Sue. I think on this one, public opinion is bearing in on the government. It really is. Because they know that there's a, there's a real explosion to take place. It may not have happened yet, but they're very conscious of the danger. But you're dead right on the deficit. We've been running a defence budget, which is budgeted at 36 billion, actually running out at about 43 billion. A huge deficit every year, but I don't see a cutback in that. The deficit will have a very significant effect. I would not at all be surprised that when we do start to think about pulling out of Afghanistan, the deficit is not one of the key reasons to do so. John, about economics, you're entirely right, John. If we can get the economy going, we won't need troops there. We'll have people with a, with a long-term commitment to the country in which they're living, rather than having troops on every corner. And I'm going to refer to this in a minute. Um, I have written a book, which um, I commend to you all, still available in all the best bookshops. Um, for a very cheap price, it's called Swords of the Plowshare, and it goes into how you can do uh, post-conflict reconstruction, drawing from my experience in Bosnia and elsewhere. By the way, every single one of the lessons about how you do these, we have contravened in Afghanistan, including failing to get the uh, economy going and failing to establish the rule of law. Um, on the issue of opium, actually, it was again John who raised this, actually a good deal of work has been done by the Senelis Council, and those interested in this, I would recommend that you read their report about how we could buy up the opium crop. In the end, I have to tell you, I looked at it very closely when they were asking me to go to head up the international community in Afghanistan. It doesn't work, because there aren't the marketing structures in there to be able to market alternative crops. Opium has its own marketing structure, sadly. And secondly, because whatever price you establish, the opium traders will simply raise the price above the one you buy it for and you'd be simply putting more money into the opium, the illegal opium trade. So it's a good idea on the surface, but actually it doesn't work in practice. We looked at it very, very carefully. David is right. The Obama midterms are the ones that I think are crucial here. Obama needs to show some success before the midterms. I wonder whether he can. I'm not sure I agree with David about the fact that all our terrorism is homegrown. The fact is that the Midlands uh, and the Bolton, uh, the bombers and that terrorist uh, House, those terrorist houses in Bolton were actually inspired by and planned from and launched by Al Qaeda abroad. They may be in our society, but they're very much taking their instructions from abroad. Uh, Leslie, action. Um, oh no, the, the co uh, no, I'll move on from Leslie because she was, I think, answered by Seamus very effectively. I agree with you completely. Let us not forget, I mean, Seamus says NATO is a co war instrument. Excuse me, guys. I mean, this really, you do have to get off your, 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 your prejudiced view of the word of exchange. NATO was the people who went in to save my beloved Bosnians from catastrophe. It was not a Cold War instrument then. I remember being in the mountains above Kukesh uh, in Kosovo when I had a young woman come up to me, driven by her home, from her home by Milosevic, and say, for the first time in my life, people are fighting a war for, to put me back in my home as a refugee. It was NATO who did that. Now, of course, NATO has been an instrument of Cold War, but it's tried to turn itself into an instrument of post-conflict stabilization. And by the way, it's done that bloody successfully in both Bosnia and Kosovo and elsewhere. And you are dead right. The last seven of the last eight interventions NATO has made has been in Muslim countries. And it has not been rejected. It has not been to drive Muslims down. It has not been, as Seamus suggests, to occupy that country and improve imperialism. It has been to give the countries back and to stop the most appalling acts being committed against Muslims. Remember Srebrenica, remember Kosovo, remember the instrument that delivered that, that was NATO. Um, now, 
there are a lot of other things we'll suffer from as well if we, um, if we let NATO go down. But not least, NATO's attempts, blundering in some senses, not clever in others, to try and build itself from a military alliance into something that can build peace after war, also needs to be regarded as a good thing rather than a bad one. Ali about servicemen, absolutely right Ali, I've seen them myself, but they aren't just a product of the Afghan war, I remember them after Northern Ireland, I remember them after Bosnia, we do forget them, and you're absolutely right, you won't go down to the night shelter in Christmas, at Christmas time in Yeovil, and you'll see them there too. I want to mention just for a second, the just war. Look, and again, it's, I, I've gone into it in some detail in my book, take a look at Thomas Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas in the Just War identifies six basic principles in which it is just to go to war. And by the way, these are exactly the same principles that apply today when it comes to the legitimate interaction of the international community in the domestic jurisdictions of other states. And these are these. Principle number one, there has to be a breach of the law, in our case, international law. Principle number two, that that breach is not just confined to the country concerned, but it threatens the wider peace. 9-11 in this case, weapons of mass destruction, in others. It threatens the wider peace of the region of the world. Um, principle number three, you have exhausted all diplomatic avenues to resolve the issue. Principle number four, the means by which you are used to solve the problem are proportionate to the problem, so you can't use nuclear weapons. Principle number five, it is legitimate. It is legitimate under international law. And I'm sorry, Seamus, you are just wrong. Iraq was probably an illegitimate war. There was no specific resolution on Iraq. The Americans, and I'm sad to say the British, used existing resolutions as cover. But nobody that I know of in the international legal profession regards those as legal cover for the war. That is not the case in Afghanistan. I know of no, I know of no legal authority who says the Afghan operation was not legal under international law and precisely legitimized by UN Security Council resolution. And our actions in Afghanistan today are specifically covered by UN Security Council resolution. That is not the case in Iraq. And the last principle, the last of the finest principles, is that there has to be a reasonable prospect of success. You should not intervene where there is not a reasonable prospect of success because that's simply needlessly to waste lives in unnecessary war. So I would argue that Afghanistan does conform to the six principles of Aquinas, at least in large measure. I just want to quickly say, where the consequences, this failure foreseeable. No, I believe the Afghan war was there to be won. It had the support of the population. It had the backing of the international community. It could be done. The reason we are winning, losing in Afghanistan is not because it was inevitable, it's because we've done it so badly. And let me warn you this, that in a very unstable world, if we release, if we relinquish the, the, the necessity under international law to, to intervene in the domestic jurisdiction of other states, in a period when we are deeply interdependent on each other, when resource wars are going to be an issue, when the spread of weapons of mass destruction are going to be a fact of our lives that will threaten all of us, if we relinquish that possibility in the future, you're going to live a much, much, much more dangerous life than if we retain that. It's been done wrong in Afghanistan, I agree, but that isn't to say it shouldn't be done at all. Very quickly, look, I have to say to you, Seamus, look, it, you really mustn't misuse polls. The fact that a majority are sympathetic to the government, uh, sorry, are not sympathetic to the government in, in Afghanistan does not mean they're opposed to us. This is about their disagreement with Karzai. Well, who can agree with Karzai? But the figure is, do you support the international intervention? You mustn't elide these two facts. Do they support the Karzai government? No. I would find it very difficult to support the Karzai government. But do they want our troops out immediately? Were they opposed to the NATO intervention? Absolutely not. And the opinion polls consistently show that. And if you reject the opinion polls, <coughs> which Seamus does, use them one minute, rejects them the next, but if he does that, then look at the balance. In election after election after election, no single person has put themselves forward in Afghanistan for, to, to be elected by the people of Afghanistan, arguing that NATO should leave. And don't tell me that it's because they couldn't. Of course they could. Anybody could put themselves forward saying, I am now going to stand on the basis that I want the foreign troops out. Nobody has done that. And everybody who has won both the first positions and the second has been supporting uh, the NATO operation. You cannot doubt that this operation is not, although you might like to believe it from a, a, a certain point of view, uh, somehow a foreign intervention which is imperious against the will of the people. The opposite is the truth. Truth, and I come back to the central point here. Leave Afghanistan today, and we may have to if we fail, but leave, it, leave Afghanistan today, or lose. 
And we do indeed abandon the majority of people who want us to be there to help to improve their lives. We abandon them in large measure in the south of Afghanistan to the Taliban, whom only 5% of them want to see back. And we also, in my view, seriously damage our capacity to be able to uphold international law in the future. I don't think that's a good way to go, I have to say to you very bluntly. Thank you.